afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, I've just seen from all of the comments there, you're all joining from either snowy places or um, sunny places. And some people like Simon on the beach. Well done, everybody, for braving the, the, the colder weather that we've got in spring. So um, everybody should know me by now, but I'm Wendy, Chief Fish of, uh, Crowdca uh, sorry, of uh, Farfish. And I've got Louise Archer. Delighted to have Louise on the show um, from Rechain Search. Um, so thank you for joining us, Louise. Thanks for having me, Wendy. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. Now, I think it would be rude for us not to acknowledge International Women's Day. So what best way to have a lover, a brilliant international woman and businesswoman on the show to celebrate the, um, yeah, what, what we do, I suppose. I always feel a wee bit weird about this sort of like International Women's Day, but I think it is good that we acknowledge what we're doing as females and the businesses that we have uh, developed and to everybody out there congratulations well done keep going <laughs> um <laughs> i think is a good way to put that and uh, good to recognize it as well so last um last month um in the crowdcast we had john on from pricing we looked at different pricing models and retained models came up so i really wanted to get an expert in the retained um search area which i think in the uk everybody jumps to that's louise so very excited to have you on board. And you were a contingent recruiter um, all those years ago and then have now crossed over to retained and then you're running a training business, helping lots of other recruiters make that uh, transfer across. It'd be great just to understand a little bit of the thing from you in terms of how you got to do what you're doing um, and your business and then we'll dive into everything retained. Oh, shall I start? Yeah, if you just tell us a little bit about how did you get into retained search yourself and then just into, you know, how you've been helping in and then we can dive into sort of the questions and structure that we've got. That would be really helpful. Yeah. OK, cool. Well, um, it was a bit of an accident for me, really. Um, I have always loved recruitment and I was a contingent recruiter for about 13 years um, and I did really well. I did really well at it. Um, I got to uh, the stage where I'd come, I'd, I'd been out into in the States, um, I had uh, recruited across Europe, um, I was at kind of fairly senior sort of mid-management management levels, um, but it wasn't until I had a young family that I really started to struggle for time, and the time that I was spending on positions and working really, really hard and using what, what was then years and years and years of experience and I was applying that experience and knowledge only to find that the client had decided to go down a different route or, oh, thanks very much for your hard work on that, but we're going to do this or someone's dropped in a CV and we're going to, and I just started to lose my love for it really and I and I got a bit frustrated well that's probably a bit of an understatement um and then I met a guy who was working with me and he was working with me and I was like what I thought it was only like senior and executive and um you know the pinstripes down in London and and I and and it clearly wasn't because he was doing it doing it well and I was lucky enough but he taught me how to work in a different way. It didn't change the level I was working at. Well, ultimately, it took me up into more senior levels, but initially it didn't. Um, I was just able to secure the financial commitment from the client and it, and therefore able to work with them um, to uh, the conclusion of the projects. And that just changed everything for me, um, where I was on the verge of leaving the industry and thinking, I just can't, this isn't sustainable for me as a, as a single parent. Um, you know, with with little time to waste, um, to to saying I to falling back in love with what I was doing again, and and a whole different world opened up for me. Um, I went on to work for a professional research firm, one of the world's leading, and um, a sophisticated executive search firm, and learn a whole load, a whole different world that I didn't even know existed. Um, and I was lucky enough that um, a few years later, a guy that I had worked with. Um, at Air Swift, which was the firm that uh, Matt and I uh, ended up ultimately rolling out a retained model um, globally in, uh, contacted me and asked me if I would go and do some consulting for the, the firm he joined. And that was kind of where the external training piece came in. And I agreed. I did a piece for them. They started running retained work and somebody else that they knew said, I've just heard about what you did for Kieran. Uh, will you come and do that for us? So 
uh, it kind of it was by accident that I'm doing what I'm doing really it's grown arms and legs since then and turned into something and that I'm really proud of yeah well done and, well I think I do have a little bit actually Simon just just tell me if you have got that uh, feedback that you're getting oh are you getting some feedback from myself there just to make sure that's okay I'm just going to hopefully it's okay but um, I'll keep going and you can let me know. It is. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, yes, I mean, as you mentioned there, it's um, it's been very much focused on timing, hasn't it? And you were motivated there to change what you were doing and changing from contingent into, into retained because the timing was right for you. So for the audiences out there as well, you know, when, when is a good time to think about retained? Like, what, what would you think, you know, in terms of making that switch? That's a really good question. Um two two things really for me are indicators um that it's a good time the first is if because because basically fundamentally if you're happy with what you're doing you like the way you're working and you're enjoying what you're doing and it's working for you it's going to be very difficult for you to change and affect the change um in what you're what in the way that you're working and what you're doing um likewise for your clients if your clients are happy with the way that everything is working and it's working for them they're getting what they want when they want it and it's an enjoyable process you're going to find that very difficult and um, to change the way they work but if there's an issue on either side and it doesn't necessarily need to be both but if there's an issue on either side in that you are starting to get frustrated with spending time on positions that don't result in a fee where you know you could do so much better if you've had some financial commitment from your client um, and it, you're starting to fall out of love a little bit with that contingent uh, no win no fee model then it's a really good time to look at doing it differently because there is a different way of working and it isn't that difficult and it isn't that difficult to learn um, and equally if your clients are getting frustrated if they're constantly pestering you for we need more cds or we need you to help us and it, you're not you're frustrated about not being able to reach a result on things or they're frustrated and if a client isn't getting what they want when they want it and it's not an enjoyable process then it's the perfect time to transition them to a better way of working so i'm sure a lot of people in the audience will be sitting there thinking I can relate to a lot of those things that you've just mentioned. <laughs> the general street, uh, uh, frustrations with recruitment. So, you know, that's the biggest challenge. It's like, how do they start? So, you know, what are the differences that they have to think about in terms of, I want to start retained? You know, how, how, what's the sort of plan that you start to think, get them thinking about? Um, well, I think it, it, there's a common misconception that retained is um, is a process that's reserved for a senior and executive and um, uh, you know high flying positions or confidential assignments, um, but that isn't the case. Um, the easiest way to start um, is to start seeing the problems that the contingent model isn't solving. And when you see those problems, um, start to think and realize that there, there's, there's ways of solving these problems, but you can't necessarily solve them on a no win, no fee basis because it's too risky. So the first stage is to start identifying clients who have challenges that aren't being solved by the contingent model. It might be difficult to fill, it might be a difficult location, it might be a niche skill set, it could be an age requirement that's been out for some time and they've been um, you know, looking for six months for, for somebody. It could be multiple positions where one relatively easy, but three, four, five starts to get much, much harder and start asking questions. Are you getting what you want when you want it? Is it an enjoyable process? And get to the heart of whether the customer is is happy with what they're doing and once you start uncovering um the fact the pain then customers start to be receptive to a different way well why are you asking and then you can start to explain well there is a different way of working actually and it isn't very with with a um a delivery process that will enable you to solve the problems that aren't being solved and a financial commitment should allow you to put that process in place, you should be in a position to be able to, to help your client where you weren't before. 
And it's really interesting because I remember even, I think it's one of the things that we go, we're, we're all guilty of in terms of recruiters to take a role on and think, right, what's the brief and like start looking for it. But just taking that time with that client and asking a few of those questions, you know, one of the big ones as well. So how long have you been looking for this role? And it was always a trigger for me to think, well, hang on a minute, how many agencies have looked at this? How long has it been opened? Then there's some challenges there to unpick. Absolutely. And one of the, well, several of the questions that um, you, you it's, it's going to help be helpful to ask at that stage that lots of people don't ask is not only how urgent is it, how long have you been looking, um, but when do you need this person in place by, but what methods have you been using so far? Mm-hmm. And, and how did that go? How has that been going for you? Because if if they've been using the contingent method and it hasn't yielded the results, it doesn't matter how many different people do it, it's still the same method. And it doesn't make sense for you to keep doing the same thing and expect something different to happen, nor does it make sense for them to keep doing the same thing and expect something different to happen. I think it's really good because it's almost like we've packaged that up as a sort of discovery call then more to be able to then pitch your solution. Um, now, one, I'm just going to jump into one of the questions that Simon has, has just posted there as well, because it actually leads on to where I was going with it. You know, the delivery model, is the delivery model significantly different to, from delivering on contingent to retained? Yes. <laughs> would you like to would you like to explain a little bit more and elaborate on that? So the way that I would explain a retained delivery process um, for a niche or a critical hire would be um, that it's essentially best practice headhunting. The, it would begin with a full briefing session and that would involve all of the stakeholders and together we would agree and define uh, the parameters of the search and the process and that would include agreeing a full role profile, agreeing um, the functional and the behavioural competencies, the target companies, any off limits, agreeing the geography, timeline, um, our process on our side and the process on theirs. Um, we would together agree um, on the steering meetings throughout the search, the geographical parameters, and importantly, the employee value proposition. So what message are we actually taking to the market? Um, We would then go away and cast a net over the talent pool and systematically identify every candidate that looks to meet the criteria for the position and then approach them by every means possible. Yes, of course, email and LinkedIn and all of the usual methods. Um, but um, we would also include professional but direct headhunting to gain as much interest in the opportunity as possible. And um, through that process, a long list of candidates um, emerge, and those candidates will have been assessed against the brief, both functionally and behaviourally. Uh, they're what we call QIA, they qualified against the position, interested in the opportunity and assessed against the brief. Um, and then we would jointly agree with the client a short list of between three and five candidates for them to take to interview. And um, throughout the process, and the whole process is transparent, we'll be sharing with them every week our progress, um, showing them all of the candidates we've identified, all of the candidates we've approached, who's interested, who's not interested, why they're not interested. We'll be collecting intelligence through that search to be able to steer the search accordingly, um, such as salary information, live accurate data gathered from the target talent pool, benefits, bonuses, perception of their business in the market, competitor intelligence, such as competitor structures, career paths, what do people want from their careers, all of which informs and feeds into the talent acquisition strategy. And we'll re-steer the search if we're faced with a challenge using that information accordingly. And by the end of the project, We'll be putting the client in a position where they're making their hire from everybody that is available to them in the market at this time. And we can't do that on a, a no win, no fee basis. We can't put them in that position. So that was definitely more than a yes answer there. That was awesome. And I think as a recruiter, I put myself into a recruiter or a recruitment agency owner's seat there. And when I'm listening to all of that, I'm like, yes, that's what I want. Yes, that's what I want. So why is that so difficult, do you think, for recruiters to articulate that to the clients? Because that's effectively your sales pitch there. 
Yeah, it is. Um, it is difficult to articulate, particularly if you um, if you don't know how to competency based assess candidates. If your process at the moment is, you might be doing all of those things, but how much information are you sharing with your client, and how, and what does that actually look like? Um, when it comes to um, you know the employee value proposition, how are you defining that? How are you taking that to the candidates? What marketing are you doing around the EVP? All of the little pieces around it. Um, if you don't know what that looks like and haven't done it before, it's very difficult to tell a client that you do. And I think that's it. We just summarise it all and just take it for granted what we're doing. Now, Moan, I hope you don't mind bringing you in from the community, uh, the comments there. You've said exactly what uh, Louisa just said. I'm kind of doing all of that, but it's all contingency, you know, but I, I'm not getting the benefit of a routine. And, you know, I think that could explain, you know, how are you packaging that up? Yeah, yeah. And that, it's funny you say that because lots of people are doing a lot of this work already and they're already carrying out what um, what would be done on a retained basis. But there are some key differences. So lots of people are going and um, systematically identifying all the candidates, but they're not showing the client those candidates. So you would send a CV or three CVs or four CVs and say those are the best of the 200 or whatever that I've identified, but the client not be certain that that is the case because they don't know for certain who else you've rejected or spoken to or not spoken to. So the transparency is important, for example. Um, how you share the profiles as well is important. So on a contingent basis, you would typically, you'd find somebody and because you're contingent, because it's no way, no fear, you're at risk of somebody else sending that CD in. So you've got to send it. On a retained basis, you don't. And here's why. If you send a candidate before the client has seen all of the options available to them, there are so many risks. You run the risk of either the candidate is stand out good is absolute rock star they interview the candidate because they're in a contingent process and you push them through they've probably got other things going on as well um you're probably 50 percent likely to land the candidate and there's, there's a chance that they might not accept the offer you then have a client that compares everybody to that one candidate and nobody else measures up Every, yeah but they're not quite as good as sophie or whoever it was um which is almost setting yourself up for failing or it's the alternative which is if the candidate isn't brilliant and you've missed the mark somehow and they then see that candidate and then they doubt your ability to be able to identify the right candidate or to be able to find the right candidate so it can have the opposite effect if you don't if either way you're putting yourself in a position where um you're, you're asking your client to make a decision on a candidate having not seen all of the options available mm -hmm. to them. So often what happens in a retained process is that a client will hire a candidate that they wouldn't have hired in a contingent process simply because you're able to put them in a position where they are confident that that candidate is the best candidate that's available to them in the market at this time. So yes, I get that you're probably doing all the things on a contingent basis that you that I've mentioned, and I'm already doing that already. But the way in which you're doing it matters too, and makes a big difference to the outcome. And that makes perfect sense again. So, and I think when we were chatting before the show, you know, you mentioned the whole perception of finding that perfect candidate. Yeah. And you've just demonstrated why the candidate might not be perfect, but you've taken your your clients on a journey in order to allow them and help them see that this is the candidate that they, they need out of all the available candidates that are there. I guarantee that you can hire the perfect candidate for them. The perfect candidate might not exist. Um, even if the perfect candidate does exist, they might not want to come and work for this client right now uh, at this time. So you can't do that. Nobody can, nobody can guarantee that the perfect candidate is going to be what they end up with. Um, but what you can guarantee is that you can take a thorough brief, that you can line that brief up with what does exist in the market as best you can. You can guarantee that you can take that message to every single one of the candidates that looks to meet that brief and bring all of the people that is humanly possible to the table to the table. And you can guarantee 
that they will be in that position at the end of the project where they're making their decision from everybody that is available to them uh, at this time. And you can't do that on a contingent basis because you're working at risk and you have to send the CVs through exactly. as you find them. And I hope that um, helps. We've got a question over from Samantha. She was um, listening on LinkedIn Live and she was saying exactly that, you know, due to the candidate shortage in recent times, you know, which is really frustrating, but this has become really tougher to manage the expectations. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of it is our culture and contingency is, yet no problem, I'll take that job and I'll fill it, you know? Yeah. And what you're saying there is how to manage your expectations along the journey because you're allowing to do that because you have a financial commitment up front in terms of saying they're in a process with you. Would that be fair? I get that it is tempting to say, yeah, give me the job and I'll fill it. Um, but just take a moment to step back and look at, okay, last time you went to market in this way and your recruiter took the job and said they would fill it, how did it go? Did you get what you wanted when you wanted? Was it an enjoyable process? If it was, why aren't you just talking to that recruiter again? Why are you talking to me? Um, and if it was you that did it, how did it go for you? Did Was it an enjoyable process? Did it all work perfectly well? In which case, I would just do what you did last time. But if there's a problem on either side in that it was frustrating for you or it's frustrating for the client, it doesn't make sense to do the same thing again. It makes makes so if they want to go and do that again that's fine but it doesn't make sense for you to so i would just take a moment to, to assess whether the contingent model is getting the right was is getting the result the client wants and they're enjoying it i think it's, it's yeah it just makes perfect sense and it's the confidence that you deliver in, in as well louise that i think a lot of people could be taking there and say look that's cool if you want to do it this way do it that way but if you want a different way of doing it this is how i deliver it and mm -hmm. most people will buy into that um, I'm sure I wouldn't be off the mark in saying that some people would buy into that retained search and maybe if they go down the road because you're helping to show what's on the market, they might even change their job a little bit in terms of what they're actually looking to no, they do for a lot yeah. as well. How do you handle that? Yeah, I was talking um, this morning with uh, one of our members who has experienced that in the um, steering calls, the steering meetings of searches and the delivery process. The, um, there's an old Buddhist saying, apparently David Edmonton introduced me to it, um, that um, when uh, when you're working with a client in partnership in this way, basically, that you you become a slave to the problem. You both become slaves to the problem. So when you're transparent and you're sharing what exists in the market, let's not forget, we can't manufacture people. We're not here to produce a shortlist or create a shortlist or... Um, uh, uh, you know, manufacture, yeah, uh, uh, create people. What we do and our job is to execute the search in its entirety and to bring the evidence to the client um, and the information and the intelligence of uh, to, to help them base their decision of what to do when we face a challenge. And um, when you approach it like that and you become, both of you become slaves to the problem, uh, it becomes a, what shall we do about this? Instead of this city isn't good enough, what are you going to do about it? Or the position is still empty, where are the candidates? It becomes um, a joint challenge to overcome. And you find that the clients start to say, okay, well, let's have a look at that salary data again, or let's have a look at that perception data again. How can we change our EVP that's going to appeal to them? Let's look at what they said, the answers to the question of, you know, what do you want from your careers or who are the employers of choice in this market and why are they the employers of choice? How can we tailor our EVP that's going to appeal to them? What is the career path that these people are saying they want? So how can we alter? And they start to help you with the problem instead of uh, beating you over the head of the stick <laughs> yeah absolutely which does happen and i think just to jump on because you mentioned uh, you know actually headhunting in terms of approaching candidates directly i think nick has um on the chat there um winhurst has a good example there of how he feels that he's just had a mental block with approaching candidates directly like that in terms of being able to headhunt them and do you have any advice in terms of you know how to identify those candidates and actually make that approach yeah, I, I mean, it, it probably is more of a mental block than physical. You know, there's lots of tools now that we can use. 
yeah, LinkedIn's great. Um, lots of people do have contact details on LinkedIn. Um, the internet's an incredible resource. I'm old enough, I'm, yeah, long enough in the tooth to not have had that when I was a recruiter. Um, the good old telephone book in the other pages. Yeah. And just randomly dialing switch numbers uh, near to the switchboard number. But yeah, we've got um, Lusher and Zoom and all sorts of things that will gather phone numbers from a physical um, barrier perspective. And almost, almost certainly that's a mental block. And the way that I have always got over it myself, and I was never particularly confident at it, and it, I've grown in confidence with this sense of duty. And it's a bit like... Um, uh, a couple of another quotes just occurred to me, Eleanor Roosevelt's quote, which is nice for International Women's Day, isn't it? Yeah. Um, which is, um, if you have a genuine belief that, that what you have solves a need, then it's your duty to take it to your customer. And that's how I feel about um, retained as a method to taking it to clients. It is my duty to explain to my clients, if they're happy with a contingent model, that's fine, Karen, I'm doing it, but it's not you and the results they're looking for. There's another way of working and here's what it looks like and this is the results it produces. It's the same for candidates. You're, the opportunity that you have, they don't know of. They might not be interested in it and that's fine, but at the moment they don't know of it. It's your duty to make them aware of it. If then when they're aware of it, they decide they're not interested in it, that's fine. It's not a problem. If they, Even if they tell you they're not interested in it in a not very pleasant way, that's okay. You now know that your duty is done and you've taken it to them. The reason you must take it to them is because lots of people don't read their LinkedIn messages and they don't look at emails and they won't really fully digest it. But when you pick up the phone and you call them, they will listen to you. And if they then say, I'm not interested, then that's fine. It's no problem. For example, have I got time to give another example? Abs please do. Yeah. Yes, loving it. Um, my people call me, people try to get hold of me all the time. They send me emails, they send me messages, they're trying to sell things to me, all manner of things. My phone number is on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Nobody phones me. Nobody phones me. If somebody actually rang me and they had something that they genuinely had researched my business and said, this will help you because of this and this, I would be happy to listen to them. But they don't. So when you're on the verge of picking up that phone, think those two things. Firstly, they are not aware of this opportunity and it's your duty to make them aware of it. And it's okay if they're not interested. Once you've done that, that's fine. You now know. And secondly, nobody else is calling them. Everyone else is just sending emails. So don't just do what everyone else is doing. Do something different. And it is all you're doing very nicely there, Louise, is just taking the whole sort of sales ethos away and turning it into you have a moral obligation to let this candidate know that they've got a brilliant yeah. job that could be theirs. I, and I'm well, really not necessarily brilliant, but here are the facts. This yeah. is the position. This is the opportunity. This is what um, somebody can achieve and, and, and uh, create in this position. Is this something you want to find to out find a bit more about? It. And if you yeah. do, when's a good time for us to talk? Now's probably not the time because I've just railroaded you with a call in the middle of the day, but maybe on your way home from work or when you're out walking the dogs tomorrow morning, whatever works for you. That's so I hope like. that helps because that definitely gives a different approach, I think, possibly than maybe helps get over that mental block. And I think, Louise, as well, shout out, I was um, telling one of my clients, Philippa, from Team Network again, Heart, from Heart, Re Heart Recruitment as well. And she was dead excited because she just sold a retainer that was 26K. And she said, you know, exactly that whole thing in terms of, you know, it does not need to be that high levels because let's face it, getting certain skill sets at junior level is just equally as hard these days. So get paid for what you're doing and exactly. you're in the process. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I could be talking with lots and lots um, because there's other areas that I knew that we were going into, but we unfortunately have run out of time. So just looking at it in terms of if you've got, you know, we've got over 200 recruiters on listening to this just now and live on LinkedIn. If somebody wants to go and think, right, I'm going to change the way I want to work. What's their key tips or your key tips that you would then approach to how do they make a difference in starting from today? Just look for diagnosing if the contingent model is working. That's my biggest tip. Um, before you take a job spec, before you take anything on, before you take a brief and start sending CVs, what methods are they using at the moment? How well is it working for them? Are they getting what they want, when they want it? Is it an enjoyable process? If it is, they're not going to change what they're doing and why yeah. should they? It doesn't make sense. But if it isn't, equally, it doesn't make sense for you to keep using the same model. So that would be my biggest tip to start 
being honest and asking the questions to diagnose whether the contingent model is is making them happy and getting them where they want because if it isn't again it's your duty to it's your duty to provide them with the best way of working love it thank you so much louise that's been super helpful and i know from the integration or the, the questions in the community chat etc then i think you've motivated a lot of people to try something different so well done on international women's day <laughs> um, so, so thank you again i think zach's just going to post into the the chat how to get hold of you if you you do want to and, and maybe call you um in terms of now you've told the world that you're actually online where to get your number good luck with that louise um, <laughs> um but yeah open to to making some calls but i really appreciate you spending the time with firefish this afternoon um, for everybody else, um, next Crowdcast, we're going to be joined by Johnny Campbell. Um, everybody's a uh, good name um, from across the water over in Ireland. Um, social talent is his business. Um, been around a lot of time and it's obviously e-learning with a new way that we are um, conducting business these days in terms of our, um, looking at how we learn and how we train other recruiters, etc. I think he's got loads of offer. I wanted to get him on the show um, to sh share that. So that's on April the 12th at one o'clock. So please uh, get it in your diary and we'll see you in a month. Um, but yes, um, thank you so much, Louise. Um, and go out and get lots of retained business and get paid for what you do because you're all brilliant. But thank you so much for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Wendy. Bye-bye.